So um, today I am going to finish up the La Leche project. I do want to mention to you that um, we did this La Leche project by competition when you uh, are in business, in the consulting firm. I know many of you are, so I, I'm telling you stuff you already know. There's usually an RFP that stands for Request for Proposal, then several groups of consultants submit, like several candidates. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's 10. And uh, eventually the, the awarding agency uh, awards so in this case, um, they pretty much told us how to do it, or what to do rather, not how, what to do. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta these steps you got to follow. So we decided we were supposed to come up with a, with a method and we chose two methods so that nobody would ask, why didn't you use the other method? And I already explained that, it's rather detailed. We already covered that ground. And I'm gonna just kind of go at the tail of the report where they requested us we also came up with our own ideas because the RFP cannot cover everything because they're not the consultants, they're the people that actually award the projects. So I'm going to start in here and finish the day um, with 10.2. Uh, well, 10.1 is also there. 10.1 is endangered species. We had to identify the endangered species so that they take note of it. Uh, and then the backwater effects. Uh, in the issue of the endangered species, um, uh, one has to list all the species and then look them up if they're endangered or not. There's a classification of zero to seven, by the way. Um, seven is extinct, extinct in, in the wild and then extinct fully. Uh, and so we had to do that. And I had a consultant to do that. Uh, by a consultant to do this, biologist, okay? Ecologist, biologist. So then the backwater effect, I discussed or covered the backwater effects because that's important also. The, the, the dam is gonna have a reservoir and the reservoir is gonna have some backwater. The backwater will depend, the amount of backwater will depend on the slope of the channel, of the upstream channel. In this case, the upstream channel was 0 0.0099, which is almost 0 0.1, which is almost 1%. That means the backwater is gonna be very small. 1% is very small. 0.1% is sizable. And 0 0.0001, um, like the Pantanal with the 0 0.401, the backwater was 400 kilometers. In this case, we calculated something on the order of five kilometers upstream of the dam, which didn't cover a whole much after the dam itself. So there's not a problem with backwater here. There's a problem with inundation though. They're gonna inundate a sizable area which is currently being used. So that's gonna be a wrestle. As a matter of fact, I happen to know that this dam hasn't been built yet. It is, it's, it is in, in turn to be built but the reason why it hasn't been built has been because of the opposition of the local people who don't want, they don't want to get flooded. And that of course depends if they're very powerful politically, they'll stop the dam, like in every other, in many other places. If they are not, then they'll be overwhelmed and the government will, will go on and continue to build the dam. It is always well known that any time that government of any kind builds a dam, there's gonna be opposition that those that are going to be flooded question about it. So I continue in here with the environment. What we had to do an environmental mitigation plan. And for that purpose, we uh, identify the, um, the various uh, crucial situations or crucial uh, items. So I list them in here from A to L. Um, impact of changes in water flow due to dam operation. I'm just going to read them and then discuss them briefly. In the plan, it was very detailed, consistent rationale, methodology, schedule, monitoring, training, human resources, and economic resources. And all that was spelled out in the RFP. So impact of changes in water due to dam operation. Let me just move on in here, that way. Let me move to number one. Um, ecological discharge. Dams uh, are gonna hold the water, but they're not supposed to hold all the water. They used to in the past, but not anymore. Over the last 20 to 30 years, the concept of ecological discharge has been developed. Rationale. 
a minimum ecological discharge must be maintained downstream of the dam to assure the preservation of natural hydrobiological processes. There is life in the river. And we basically are not supposed to kill it all just for the sake of holding water for human beings. Okay. Uh, Professor, are you sharing your screen or intending I'm to not share? I'm sharing my screen. I'm not sharing my screen. I, I, I forgot. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. No, I'm not, not sharing my screen. I am not a, I'm not sharing in here. Right. Professor, did you did you also already take attendance or I wasn't I got here right yes. at five thirty. Who are you? Axel. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, I was missing you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. I forgot. I kind of, you know, an old man have a tendency to forget a few things, but anyway, I I I uh, I hope that uh, you understand. Okay, so we go to the rationale. I go back. I wasn't sharing, but I go back. I talked briefly about the necessity to calculate, use a heck ras in order to calculate the backwater effect on the dam. That's readily done, easily done. And, it, and of course it should be done in this case. Ecol uh, we, we work on the mitigation plan and there's the um, ecological discharge is the first one that we put in here. Minimum ecological discharge must be maintained downstream of the dam impoundment to assure the preservation of hydrobiological processes. The rivers are alive and they need to be maintained alive. Um, ecological discharge should be developed based on local experience. In no case should it be less than 10% of the mean annual discharge. In other words, there's some water that needs to be left in there. The second one, the second one is interesting and important. Recharge of groundwater downstream of the dam. When you hold water, it depends if the, if the site is permeable and those are the, that's for the job of hydrogeologists and to analyze how permeable is the dam or the dam site downstream. It shouldn't be too permeable. Otherwise, it wouldn't hold any water. But there have been instances around the world where dams have been built and within a couple of months, the entire neighborhood is wet. That happened in the dam in Argentina, the Yacireta Dam. And then, of course, the people downstream complain because you flooded my, you converted my uh, dry, uh, my land into a wetland. Uh, and it is possible and it could happen. And you understand that that is possible. Uh, so the, the aquifer downstream of La Calzada should be monitored to detect increases, ra increased rates of replenishment, which could be attributed to the increased rate of infiltration. That's the number two. Number three is loss of basin flushing. There's a need to flush the basin at recurrent intervals to simulate nature's use of floods as resetting of flushing ages. That's important and it was not considered. We used to build dams and say, okay, we're gonna hold the water and that's it, we need the water for irrigation, we need the water for domestic uses and so forth, and we weren't flushing. Now, 30, several years ago, about 30 years ago, the USGS realized that that was a mistake and they decided to do one artificial flush and they did that release a whole lot of water as if it were a flood, only that this flood is artificial. It was created by human beings. They purposely release the water. They have done this thing, this, this object twice, this objective, twice over the last 30 years. They're not doing it too often, but they, they, whenever they feel the need that they should do it. And I do believe that this is something that should be done. It's a practice that should be done around the world. I happen to know that some, uh, dams in Mexico have contributed to the uh, sedimentation downstream. Sedimentation of the, of the sand, the sand settles at the bottom of the river because there's no flushing anymore. If you released a whole lot of water, that'd be clean in no time all the way to the sea. You see, so these things need to be done. Otherwise we run into problems. Risk of dam overtopping. The dam, the reservoirs, particularly La Calzada, which is the name of that dam out there that, that will be built, must be operated to all but eliminate the risk of dam failure due to overtopping. The dam cannot overtop. If it overtops, it will fail. It will fail. In this case, you're looking at the likelihood of probably thousands of people being killed, particularly with the Nino floods, which are really terrible in terms of size. Um, degradation below the dam. The water released from the dam to be relatively sediment free that is hungry Thus, it will have the tendency to cause degradation downstream. That is a well-known fact. 
Um, this graph is uh, uh, obtained from Lane, Emory W. Lane. You, those of you that took sedimentation from me last year noted that I talked uh, greatly about that gentleman. He was my uh, academic grandfather. He was he the professor of my professor. Uh, he, um, over at Colorado State, he published a paper in 1955 where he clearly talked about talked for the first time about these subjects on the subject of geomorphology. Uh, and he published this this uh, uh, this fi picture of degradation below Fort Sumner Dam on the Pecos River in New Mexico. Sediment accumulation in the reservoir. Yes, the sediment will accumulate in the reservoir. No question about it. How much? Usually dams are considered for 100 years. So in 100 years, you should fill 80% of the dam. Uh, actually, in 100 years, you should be 20% of the dam. That's the way it is. I'm sorry, I, miss, I'm, I misspoke. Because it should operate for 100 years, right? But what actually happens in reality is that that situation is more linear. It starts growing. The, the amount of sediment accumulated in the dam starts growing. And eventually, it will, it will top the dam. It will fill the dam with sediment. There's very, been very various instances around the world, as well as in California, where the dams have filled up with sediment after 50, 60, 80 years, and they have had to undo the dams, I mean, destroy them. Dam deconstruction has been a subject for the last 20 years. Remember, not, not dam construction, dam deconstruction, okay? So the sediment acu accumulates in the reservoir. The rate of deposition is, is a function of the hydraulic and sedimentological properties. Calculations of design life are very useful, and there are methodologies to do that. Um, the rate of reservoir, reservoir filling should be estimated by appropriate methodologies. At a minimum, the Bruin formula, which is in my book, in my hydrology book, should be used to estimate. That's a minimum. There's more advanced methods than the Bruin formula, which is about 80 years old, I believe. The rate of filling should be monitored every two years. There's a case in point, then, in Peru, there's two dams that are, one of them I quoted, uh, one of them is 48% filled after, after 50 years, and the other one is 60% filled. And honestly, I mean, that's not too bad, considering that it's 60 years already gone by, uh, from 1970, 20, 50 years. So one of them, 48% in 50 years, the other one, 60% in 50 years. So they're not doing too bad, in my opinion. But there's a third dam out there. There's three major dams in the region. There's a third dam, which is off-site, not on the side of the river, not on the run of the, it's called the run of the river, not on the run of the river. And that dam is only purported to be only 8% full. So the understanding now is that if you put a dam run of the river, it will fill up with sediment. But if it's off-site, it may not, it probably will not, like the case of this example. This is a picture that I took when I was out there at the Tinahones Dam back in the year uh, 2008, particularly in relation to this project, by the way, because the Tinahones is in the region. Uh, so this is the, the small stream that has formed upstream. So we are given to understand, of course, that, every, anything that everything that you see in here is settling at the upstream portion of the dam. And because there's flow variations, first it settles, then it cuts the, the river, the little stream in there. As a matter of fact, people actually are grazing in this land. This land is, is a gift of, of whatever. It, it's not supposed to be there. It's there because uh, the sediment accumulation in the reservoir. Nutrient deficiency in the floodplain, that is, that is very important. That's very important. Uh, because nutrients, as I said the other day, is the basic sustenance of life. Uh, the problem is we have, again, society has a tendency to ignore them because we don't see them. But they're there. If you were an ecolog ecologist or a bi biologist, you would realize that they are very important. Continued reservoir operation will retain sediments and cause a long-term nutrient deficiency in the downstream flood plain. That led uh, Dr. Junk, remember I talked about that, from Germany back in the year 1989, 89, 31 years ago, to write a paper on good floods 
versa or so vis-a-vis bad floods. And he says that not all floods are bad. Most of them are good anyway, particularly those that uh, flood, uh, the flood pulse. He talked about, he defined and talked about the flood pulse. We will talk about later, that about later on extensively or more extensively. We call that the flood pulse of Dr. Junk. His name is J-U-N-K. And we pronounce it Junk because he's German, not, not English. Uh, impact on local fauna, too. We identify the local fauna. Impact on local flora. Again, we identify the local flora and talked about it briefly. Loss of agricultural lands. Yes, flooding of La Calzada would result in the loss of valuable agricultural land. This encompasses the agricultural areas in the vicinity of Mucho Mi Viejo and La U. And the La U. Okay. Uh, loss of grazing lands. Yes, there will be some loss of grazing lands. Interesting. Uh, the project or the, the, the team identified a place, a side place on the valley where a reservoir, a second reservoir, operational reservoir could be built. And that's what we recommended. Two exact same size dams in two places, one on the run of the river and the other one off. Um, it so happened that uh, the, the, the flooding of the off dam encompasses the La Viña Ranch property of Mr. Jesus Montenegro, who raises fighting bulls on his property. He's got, I don't know how many, lots, lots of them, maybe a couple hundred fighting bulls in, on his property, which is interesting. I visited the site, and uh, I was told to, to be careful out there. You know what I mean. Uh, the area survey, okay. Loss of housing, yes, there's going to be some loss of housing. This is probably the greatest deterrent to the building of the dam. The people out there, in my opinion, or in, from my experience, appear to be very powerful politically, and they don't want to lose their, their, their sites or their, their properties. In other words, in order to build a dam and benefit a whole lot of people, somebody's got to lose. Remember, I told you about that. Increasing salinity of soil and water. This is something that I'm very particularly interested in, because mostly because most people don't pay too much attention to it, and I decided that it was a niche that I could develop. Besides, I should confess or confide to you, confide, it's confide is the word, confide to you that I was, when I started my career in 1968, my first subject in the, in the area of hydraulics was... Uh, irrigation and particularly drainage. We, uh, we did a, an undergrad thesis in drainage, in agricultural drainage, not urban drainage. Those are two different things completely, okay? In agricultural drainage, what you want to do is get rid of the salt that has accumulated. How does the salt accumulate? Because the water gets into the, 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 water gets into this, into the system and it, the, uh, evapor uh, the water evapotranspires. But the water is, does, is, is not pure water. It's always water with a certain amount of salt. So the salt is left behind to accumulate. If you don't drain, if we don't drain or wash out the, the soils uh, down, down below, or downstream, wherever downstream is, the salt will accumulate and they will asphyxiate, suffocate, and you can't grow anything in there. And that is a fact, and we already know that, and it's been... I mean, that's everywhere, everywhere in the world that that does happen. So the conversion of runoff to evapotranspiration results in an increase in the salinity of soils and water, as shown by the extreme example of Tulare Lake District in California. And we have references all over. We've written extensively on this subject, and we have a chapter in this class dedicated to this problem. It's a problem that we currently face and we, we have been unable to solve. We meaning all societies have been unable to solve. Um, one example, evaporation basin at Tulare Lake Danish District, California. Uh, I am given to understand that those people out there at Tulare have already three of these big lakes full of salt, and they're working on their fourth one. And every so often, like every five years or 10 years, I'm not exactly sure about how often, they have to develop develop another one of these evaporation ponds because they're they're growing crops, so they're getting the pr products of the crops and selling them. You know, making money correctly. They should. Uh, 
but they're leaving behind the salt. They are unable to, because this is a closed basin, so they're unable to, we're going to study that in more, this in more detail later on. Uh, loss of fossil resources, I, we identify this. I went over there with my luck, you know, Professor Pons is such a lucky man. Turned out that the guy that I hired to do the biology was also a, a paleontologist. So he went over there and we were looking at the trees and the fauna, and he was also on his own avail, was looking at the fossils. <laughs> That's where I learned that the fossils were important because he, we found some fossils over there because we spent a lot of time there. And the fossils are, are the time of history. So it's important for us to collect and, and put the fossils somewhere where they could be studied. That's paleontology. So I recommend that they, they, do, they should do a survey. And before doing anything, before flooding anything, they should send an, a, a team of paleontologists out there to check the site out and make sure that the, whatever they're flooding, they're not destroying time, because that's what it is. Fossils are time. They're talking about thousands or even millions of years. Natural scenic view, yes. Uh, the, uh, it could be argued that the dam is going to be beautiful, which is fine. But it could be also argued that no, that the river was better. Some people like the river better, others like the dam. So that's that uh, differences of opinion, those differences of opinions need to be reconciled. Increase in noise, that's not, that, nothing we can do to solve that problem. Well, not really. We can attenuate, mitigate to an extent, but not completely. And finally, uh, well, that's what I would like to say about this. And um, the rest is just a repetition of what we had already said. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to our next subject. And we have two more subjects in here. We have the effect of global climate change, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And today, I, uh, yesterday I had nine, nine pieces of, of information here. But today we have ten, because I added nine. Now, I have mentioned the work of Arrhenius, Svante Arrhenius, in our, in our paper on global climate change. So I figured since I already have Arrhenius, and I read it extensively so several times, I would share it with you. I am not obliging you, nor I'm going to quiz you on the specific Arrhenius work uh, for the reason that it is chemistry. And we're civil engineers. We're not chemists. We're, if, a, if a problem gets to be a problem of chemi chemistry, we have to hire the chemist to do it. Arrhenius was a chemist. Uh, so, um, so he wrote this extremely important paper, extremely important and early paper, he talked about global climate change in the year 1896. So, uh, oh, I'm, I'm missing a period over there. I have to fix that. Uh, so for those that think that global climate change was invented by, by Gore in the year 2005, when he put his film together, of his video together, you're wrong or they're wrong because Global climate change has been around since 18, at least since 1896 that we know of. I happen to understand that there's a couple of papers earlier than that, but they were not really substantial. The substantial work early on global climate change, change was done by the Swedish, Swedish scientist Arrhenius, who subsequently got a Nobel Prize. I believe that the Nobel Prize was not gotten by him for this work, for some other work that he had done. He was an interesting gentleman because he was a physicist and he ended up dedicating her life, her later life work to chemistry. And when he started doing that, the, the chemists complained. They said, well, this guy's not a chemist. He's a physicist. He's got a degree in physics and so forth and some university out there. But he persisted and he says, yeah, I'm not a chemist, but I'm doing chemistry. And he may have been one of the first ones to actually start this, uh, the concept of interdiscipline, a physicist turned chemist, because what he was doing was chemistry. And you guys know really well that there's no, no, no specific division between physics, chemistry, or for that matter, biology. Alexander von Humboldt, who's one of my heroes, uh, came to South America in the year 1800. 
spent five years there, here, or there, rather, there in South America, specifically in Brazil, Peru, Mexico, Ecuador. He's, he also was in Ecuador. And um, after five years, he wrote a book, which uh, uh, is actually it's an encyclopedia of science of the time, science and, and politics, actually. He, he, he got into everything, absolutely everything. Uh, he wrote many books, of which the one I like is called Personal Narrative. Um, and I have read that uh, encyclopedia in the 1990s because I figured that was the, my fa the fastest way for me to understand biology, ecology, and environment, right? Because he is talking about that. So that was Alexander von Humboldt, who uh, 1800, as you can see, that's even, that is, he is even earlier than Arrhenius. As a matter of fact, many people say that Alexander von Humboldt was the, the last Renaissance man. Because after him, the, physis, the physicists came, and the chemists and the biologists, and well, first the physicists, Newton and so forth, more or less around that time, then the chemists, and then the biologists. And they separated nature into three fields. And then subsequently, they didn't talk to each other. They didn't talk to each other from the early 1900s to the late 1900s. It was only 1980 they started talking to each other. Professor Pons started talking to the biologist in 1990. For 20 years, I did my career in civil engineering and never met one biologist. And all of a sudden, I started meeting all these biologists that came up out of the woodworks because we were becoming interdisciplinary and it was necessary for us to talk to these other people. Okay? So anyway, so I'm going to be talking about the effect of global climate change on the wide range of Peru and hopefully at the end we'll have some time for me to show you the video that was produced by Jana, of course under my direction. You know, she's a junior person, you know, I told her what to do and how to do it. But she added her own artwork and stuff and you'll see it there. So, we say global climate change threatens to upset the delicate balance of nature. Uh, the sustained warming of the past 50 years has produced a host of negative effects. We highlight the effect of global warming has on the tropical glaciers. So that's the impact of global warming, war, warming on the glaciers. The impact is that they make the glaciers disappear. Is that good or bad? Well, it's bad because it's not sustainable because it was not like that in the past. Of course, we do realize, and this has been argued, that time and nature are always changing. So who are we to stop it? That's one argument. The counter argument is that, yes, it does change, but it changes slowly. So when it changes, it changes in 10,000 years. And we are making the change happen in 50 years. Compare 50 to 10,000. And then at that point, we say there is an impact. There is an effect. And we should measure it and, and attenuate the, the degree of the impact. And that's the subject that is, has become now the subject to speak about in society, global society, at this time, okay? We specifically focus on the wide range of Peru, resource of global importance and significant na natural and aesthetic value. Now, some people may say, global importance? What are you talking about? Yes, it is global importance. There's a lot of people, U.S., Europe, all over the world, that go out there to, uh, to just sightsee, to see the glaciers. Uh, to do some mountaineering or any uh, some anything else, so it's it's a global resource. Global, it's a global resource like many other glaciers around the world, the Himalayas, etc. I'm not familiar with others, but certainly the Himalayas have also been have purported to be also um, uh, contracting, that is disappearing, reducing in size. Global average have, uh, temperatures have increased about 0.6 degrees in the past 50 years. Now, for anybody that doesn't know, it's nothing. 0.6, what is 0.6? When the day varies, the temperature varies, talking about the degrees Celsius, it varies between 17 and 22 degrees Celsius, which compares to degrees Fahrenheit, maybe, I don't know, 65 to 80 or something like that. You guys know the conversion. Uh, so there's not a whole lot. Actually, there's a whole lot more change during the day than in the last 50 years. But we're forgetting at this point, those, those that argue that are forgetting that the mean average temperature is not supposed to change. The mean global temperature 
had stood at around 17 degrees Celsius for a long time. I'm not gonna say how long, but because I, because I don't know, I don't have the data with me. But now, over the last 50 years only, it has been changed. Now, of course, you guys may say, can say, oh, 50 years, that's a long time. For me, of course, I'm not even 50 years old. But the point is that in the, in the course of, of nature, nature's time is not a whole lot of time. Okay, glacier melting has caused an increase in the number of glacial lakes. So we're gonna see that there is some, some effect of this melt that we are going to have to come up with or study or pay uh, we're gonna somebody's gonna have to pay for this uh, continuing glacier melt poses a significant threat of recurring glacial lake outburst floods the so-called gloss we will explain later on in more detail what that means so let's first our first subject here is global climate change what is global climate change well that was identified by Arrhenius and I certainly invite all of you that wish to do so to read the Arrhenius paper or browse through it just to see how this whole thing originated. Uh, Arrhenius was ahead of his time completely because he was concerned about global cooling, not global warming. He discovered the process, the mechanical process, physical, physical, chemical. Physi it was, it's physical, chemical. It's not totally physical or chemical. He discovered the process and he was concerned at the time that if it cooled, if the if the, if it cooled, that Sweden was going to get colder. And he was from Sweden. He was concerned about that. As a matter of fact, I am very sure that what he wanted is if it's going to change, it better be warmed, so that Sweden can get to be a better place to live. But he did discover, or he presented the methodology, and we'll talk about that today. And uh, he had no way of knowing, writing this in 1896, listen to what I'm going to say because it's important, that in 1903, Henry Ford was going to develop the assembly line and thereby making a car affordable by Tom, Dick, and Harry, not just by presidents or important people or wealthy people, anybody could. And, and that's true nowadays. Anybody that accesses to the middle class, the first thing they do is they buy a car. The underclass, uh, those that are not in the middle class, go in the bus. That's a fact, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, we say quite correctly that the global warming of the present day, 2021, has been exacerbated in the last 30 years, largely because the Chinese are are colleagues or our neighbors out there, I guess you say neighbors in the global scene, starting accessing to the middle class. They access to the middle class and the first thing they did this, they, uh, they bought a car. At the beginning, if you remember correctly, in the early 70s and 80s, the Chinese were not producing too many cars and now they're number one. In 20 years, they, they you know, there's a lot of Chinese out there. They are now producing cars that produce everything. Chinese produce everything nowadays. In 50 years, since 1970, they started going up. 50 years is what it took China to get where they are right now. And because of that, global warming was accelerated. Because there's a lot of Chinese. For, for every American, there's five Chinese. We know that, that's statistics, okay? The, mostly re the most widely recognized indicator of global climate change is the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, which is measured at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Who did this calculation? Well, there's a lot of people. I've actually, I, I actually have a, a, a video on this I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you. I'm gonna write it down because I, otherwise I forget. Or maybe I have, a, I may have already re shared it. I have a video on who is important in this field, in global warming. There's five people that are important. But the last one is the one that gets the credit, Mr. Keeley, who died five years ago and left everything he was doing to his son. So Keeling's son, working out of the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography here in town, by the way, in La Jolla, they are the ones that measured this curve. Actually, Keeling did it only to 2010 because he passed away at that time. But as you can see, the, the work has continued by NASA and the NOAA Earth Systems Research Laboratory 
and the scripts, they, they kind of work together. Okay, one agency funds scripts and so forth. You know how it is in universities, it's always funded by the federal government. One arm or other of the federal government is funding the work at, of research at the universities. So this is the famous Keeling curve, which is, cannot be argued. It just simply cannot be argued. It is so, it has such a signal, strong signal. Now, why is it that it looks like a sawtooth? Because this only represents the Northern Hemisphere. And when it gets cold or warm, the situation changes. So I guess one could say that if Argentina had a gentleman out there that would do the same work as Keeling, the, the, the Mauna Loa for, for the Southern Hemisphere, it would be the exact opposite in terms of how the sawtooth would be exact opposite. It would be not opposite, but phased, phased out uh, six months. So global warming, the concentration of carbon dioxide, which was measured by Keeling at 318 in 1958, when he started to do this, has now March 19, that's the last time we have data here, I just checked that this morning on the web, reached the value of 410. When I first looked at this problem in the year 1990, 31 years ago, when I started teaching environmental science, I told you that already, I had to look this up because I had to be knowledgeable or show that I was knowledgeable. The number was 358, I remember very clearly, 358. So in the last 31, 40, 31, 31 years, this number has gone from 358 to 410. That's a tremendous increase. It's only 30 years. Can you believe that? You know what 30 years is? It's nothing. In the time of history, it's nothing. Okay, so it's gone up. It's gone up because more cars, more travel, more planes, more oceans. I'm sorry, more ships, more uh, everything. I don't want to mention it because it kind of, it's, it's kind of a little bit nasty discussion, really, to be honest with you, because we're all all of us are involved in this. Not everybody in the world, but all of us. I mean, we're talking about us, people in the U.S., you know, people like us, okay? We're all involved in it. Uh, so that's basically it. Now, in 1896, Vante Arrhenius published a paper, which I already posted for you. He reasoned that the air retains heat in two ways. By heat diffusion, or by diffusion, as the heat passes through the air, and by selective absorption, since some atmospheric constituents absorb great, absorb great quantities of heat. He identified CO2 as the culprit because he said that there were all other diatomic molecules, but this one was the one that was in higher concentration. And it was the one that, it was, that it could be ascribed the most anthropogenic. The others are anthropogenic too. It's been argued that, that uh, there is a large herd of cattle around the world because a lot of people eat meat. And, and the cattle, because they're ruminants, they're, they're, I guess you could say, exhaling, that's no, not exhaling, 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 uh, exhaling um, air or gas as they digest the stuff, as they digest their food. Uh, uh, Normally in English they cause something else in common English, but the point is that, and those have methane, and methane is also has, has also a similar chemical constituent, just a diatomic molecule, and methane has, has already been ascribed the the capability of causing global warming. Now we're not going to get into that because most people agree that it is the the CO two the culprit. The others are smaller. There's studies out there. You, if you want, if you're interested in this, you can go out there and research what percentage of the blame could be attributed to CO2 and what percentage to methane. At any rate, so we have in here. Now we have in here the global land. Uh, this also has been done by NASA, Goddard Institute of Space Studies. These are some of the best group of scientists in the U.S. and the world, by the way. So they've been able to correlate one with the other. Um, and therefore, we have every reason to believe that there's a cause effect in here. Every reason to believe because the, the warming of the last 30 years has not happened so in such short period in the past. 
it has happened, but not so clearly. Let's not forget that uh, 20,000 years ago, the world was uh, cold. And when the world gets cold, the sea gets down or descends. So I believe that the number is 30 to 35 meters. So 20,000 years ago, the ocean was 35 meters below. I could be wrong on that number, but uh, 30 to 35 meter rings a bell. Maybe it could be up to 60 even. So the, the ocean was low 20,000 years ago because that was the last, the end of the cold age. And then after that, it became warm. So as you can see, the period of these natural variations, it took 20,000 years to get us from the cold age or the last cold age to, to this warm age. Only that at the end of the warm age of the 20,000, we put in there a peak of 100 or 50. This is a, a peak on top of the, on the very mild mountain that was heading toward us for the last, has, has been heading toward us for the last 20 years. No, I'm sorry, 20,000 years. Okay, so now we talk about the white range. Why did we study the white range? Why not other ranges? Because Professor Ponce is from Peru, and I was I went out there and decided to do this work. Um, so I had to go over to the sites and and document the stuff and talk to the people out there, and that's what I did. I spent a, I did a couple of trips out there about a week each in order to document everything, and we did a great documentation. We didn't do any original research, mind you. This paper is a review paper of all the others, but you know what? That's the, this is the paper that gets read because it's readable and we make things readable. The other papers are complex. They were written mostly by, by Europeans uh, and they're scientists. I think they, they're glacio glaciologists, which is a specific field. And only their scientists read the paper and they don't communicate it. So our job was to try to, in layman terms or layperson terms, uh, say, repeat what these people have been saying for more than 20 to 30 years. So over here, I copied from one of the papers this map, which I think is great. It is the location of the valley, which is called the Wailas Corridor. It's a valley, there's a river in here, the Sasanta River over here, and the, 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 the peaks, the triangles, the towns, everything is indicated in here. So the peaks are on the left, the lakes with risk of avalanche on the right. The names are local, the, the Quechua names, the local native language. In most of them, everything, is, you know, all the names of the peaks are also Quechua, okay? What are the effects of global climate change? There is, as long as there is warming, there are gonna, there's gonna be glacial, glacier melt, depending on the extent of the recession. Glaciers of the White Range are largely compared to other glaciers. Were there glaciers in Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador? Yes, I have seen the ones in Ecuador. Colombia, I have not. Venezuela, I have not. My understanding from reading the literature is that the glacier, Venezuela had one glacier, was the Espejo Glacier, of which we show three pictures that I took from the, from the, European references that I consulted at the time when we did the study, which was the year 2015. In 1910, you see the Espejo Glacier, 1988. In 2008, there's no, no glacier. The Espejo Glacier of Venezuela is gone. Okay, so then we documented or purported, or went ahead and documented, or yeah, yes, document, document is a word, of recession in the wide range. And this is the data we got. Major recession range, recession rates of three wide range glaciers. The Broji, the Urwas Raju, and the Yana Mare. These are some of the more important glaciers out there. And in the period that is indicated, the recession rate in meters per year, 18, 11, 30. The trend is clearly upwards in terms of meters per year of recession rate. We took this picture, Google Earth, a Google Earth a recent picture. Google Earth does phot photography all over the world. I don't know how often I do it, every couple of years, but we took this one in the year 2015, so it could have been 2014. But I want you to note something interesting. We know enough about nature to realize that, um, that uh, the 
plants, vegetation takes over rocks and they start eating them away and produce the soil. But it takes time. It could take 50 years for that to happen because the rocks are hard and the vegetation are bugs, microbia and so forth, the microbes, and they need to have time to do this. Now look at here. This is the Yanamare, and this area over here is clear, clear of vegetation. So I'm given to understand that this used to be covered with snow. It used to be covered with snow. It just so happened that it, in the last so many years, we had to have, in order to really prove what I'm saying, we'd have to have uh, Google Earth uh, pictures uh, taken at, at different periods, and we don't have that. We could, by the way. Google, I believe, uh, can show you pictures in, of the past. And this is something that could be done as a research project. I had one of our students do that, by the way. Jana, as a matter of fact, did this as, as part of a project, I believe, for this class. I don't remember correctly, but it was a couple, three years ago. And she, she came up with the answer that there was no clear answer. In other words, there, there it, it appears that there was additional melting, but it was not exactly 100% clear based on the data supplied by Google, which was a little bit chancy, you know, because we don't own Google. Whatever Google has, they label it, and then we, we can use it. So that's the story. I myself was out there in the year 2003 and took this picture, this picture taken by me. So, and this is a Yanamare uh, glacier. We are given to understand in the last... Uh, 12 years or 10 years since this 2003, there was some melting, some additional melting. But we can't really compare or correlate because these two pictures are different. One is from the air and the other was from the site. Related effects. Effect of global climate change. What are the effects? Well, let's take a look. Climatology. Geomorphology. I already said geomorphology is very important. Hydrology. Ecology. Socioeconomics, that comes at the end after everything has been studied. Climatology, temperature increase. Is there a temperature increase? Yes. Is there glacial recession? Yes, positively. Temperatures have risen substantially in the past 50 years. Glaciers have receded substantially in the past three to five decades. That's a correct. That's been studied by all these glaciologists. Geomorphology, the formation of lakes. The number of glacial lakes in the vicinity has increased substantially, more than 70% in the past 50 years. So what's happening over here? Where the, the, um, the mountains have their morphology determined by nature. The, the ice caps are at the top. When they melt, the water comes down and it could come and get into the river at that point, at which point it will eventually get to the ocean if it's not stopped there artificially somewhere. But it could also get stuck in a lake. That's how lakes are formed in the Andes. And so we are given to understand that lakes could form due to glacial melt. So the number of glacial, glacial, glacial lakes in the vicinity has increased more than 70% in the past 50 years. Glacial lake outburst. Now, these lakes form when they form, and nobody's controlling them as to the strength of their limits and so forth. So these lakes could, could have an outburst or a breach, a natural breach, and at that point, it's, it's anybody's guess as to you could have a, a sort of a dam failure, only that that dam was a natural dam and it failed uh, naturally, let's say, because it overtopped somehow. So glacial lake outburst remains a threat to life and property in the downstream valleys. And people have actually documented this stuff, and I am here to report and documentation of these things. Hydrology, seasonal. In the short term, changes in seasonal runoff. So the hydrology is going to change because the, the ice caps served as reservoirs. They're no longer there, then there's no reservoir anymore. So the hydrology, the distribution of water throughout the year will change. Annual, in the middle term, in the medium term, increased surface runoff is taking place at 
as the additional melt reaches the stream network. That's right. There's more water. There's more water. Um, how can I say? Te uh, for the time being, but eventually it will disappear. The same thing is happening in California, by the way. Let's not go too far. California is also the state of California is also concerned at the time that we are losing our our storage, our our snow storage. We're going to have to do something about it in the future. I am sure that the Department of Water Resources, Resources in Sacramento is on top of this. Fluoride annual. In the long term, reductions in surface runoff are bound to take place. As basin moisture is no longer being stored as snow. Right, correct. Ecology. On life zones, at least 10 biological life zones have been identified, which will tend to shift. That's true. When water relationships change, uh, ecological relationships and biological life zones also shift and change. On floral species, more than 50 ground cover and 18 woody and herbaceous species have been identified, will be somewhat affected. It's hard to, at this point, to assess the extent of the effect. The effect. The, I'm not a, a forest gentleman or forest person, so I can't tell you how much. But it, there will be an effect, no question about it. Faunal species, same thing. More than 70 animal species will be affected. Socioeconomics. On human settlement, the people living in the Calle Honda Huaylas, that is the Huaylas Corridor, will be directly affected. If there is a GLOF, uh, a GLOF, we call it the uh, lake outburst, flood, uh, there, there could be people killed, as has happened in the past. The changes in the wide range are currently occurring. Uh, new glacial lakes. How many new glacial lakes? That has been documented extensively. I was really surprised to see these numbers, to be honest with you. It's kind of almost unbelievable, but I cannot say it's wrong because I don't have any means of checking them that if they're right or wrong. But the, these numbers have been reported by both Carey at the bottom of table four in a, in a, in a work that's been cited in 2010, as, all, uh, as also by Nelson Santillan, who is the engineer of the federal, of the Peruvian government in Lima, involved directly. He's the boss of this thing. He's the boss of everything. So I had a chance to talk to him extensively, and he told me all this information. He realized what I was doing, and I told him, you know, that's exactly what I was doing. And since I have, I guess, impeccable credentials, he believed in me, and he gave me all the information that I asked for. Okay, so Nevada Walkan, this is one of the of the lakes showing the glacial glacier lakes on the west, on this west side. I did want to say that at the, at the first time, at the beginning, I, I could not believe that, that the number of lakes went from 200 in 1950 to 800 in the year 215. 2015, so four times. Where are those all those lakes? I guess if you are careful and you want to, and you want to fly over, if you have a project, you have to have a project, and you want to fly over Google Earth, you will be able to count them, as those people have counted them. Okay, you don't need to fly Google Earth. You just buy the the remote sensing products, and you'll be able to count the the lakes. So we have a reason to believe that these numbers are accurate because of the remote sensing capability that we have right now, meaning we, anybody, okay, typically scientists. The role of great glacier melt. This is a discussion on the annual versus dry season differences. There is annual versus dry season differences. Social impact, yes, there's a few towns in there. This is the biggest town. This town was buried in the year 1940 and 5,000 people were killed. But of course, the year 1940 had nothing to do with the current global warming. It was something else. It was an, I believe it was an earthquake. It was an earthquake which released a whole bunch of ice from one of the peaks and that came down and, and created the slide, a huge slide that killed 5,000 people. 1941, I believe. Yes, December 13, 1941. So here, I we document uh, the work that was done by Kerry, I believe. He, he wrote a great book 
it was a it was a PhD thesis somewhere in, at the university in the Pacific uh, in the West Pacific Northwest I think it was the state of Washington. Uh, he documented all the stuff and we proceeded to you know to report it what what he had done, the glaciers, the maximum elevation, the day when when this happened, the affected city and the effect. I should tell you at this point that I quote unquote discovered something. There's four major cities. Three of them have been affected. One has not. Why? Is it because they're lucky or what? And no, it's not because they're lucky. Let me show you why. This city has been affected. This one has been affected. This one has been affected by the killing of 5,000 people in the year 1941. This one has not been affected at all. Nobody ever saw a slide or a glow over in Requine. Why? It doesn't take an Einstein to figure it out that these guys are downstream of a river. Karas is downstream of a river. Yungai is downstream of this valley over here. And Waras is the worst, directly in the at the mouth of this river. I don't remember his name right now. Well, this city over here has no, is not in any downstream immediately, the immediate mouth of any river. So if you try to solve the problem, the problem will be solved. The problem of attack by the glops of the cities will be solved by moving the towns. Just move the town of Waras. 20 kilometers south, you guy, take your pick, south of north, same thing with this. But that's easier said than done. Nobody's going to move the cities. When Katrina happened in the year 2005 in Louisiana, the mayor of, of uh, New Orleans went on TV the next day to say that he had the solution. This move the town to the next hill. <laughs> That's what he said, unbelievable. Why? Because New Orleans uh, average elevation is minus half a foot below sea level. They're under the sea. So anytime you have a little thing in there, you get flooded, right? He had to retract his statement a couple of days later. They asked him to retract or we're gonna kick you out of here. <laughs> Something like that happened, okay? I was not privy to that conversation, but I know they keep retracting. He says, no, I really didn't mean to, I was kidding about moving the town. People don't want to move where they are. They would rather suffer than to move, okay? So that's the story on, on this, uh, on this uh, environmental impact. I mean, we were here, and now I'm showing, I'm showing you here some of, the, some of the lakes, some of the more important lakes that have generated gloves. And finally, the remarks, which we already are familiar with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to what I have done uh, over here. And I'm going to show the video, at least in the time we have. This is a 20-minute video, so I think we have the time. Exactly. Global climate change refers to the accelerated warming of the world's climate over the past 50 to 60 years attributable to the burning of fossil fuels. Since the dawn of the industrial age, developed human societies have been burning coal, natural gas, and petroleum, ostensibly to power industry, urban development, and transportation. The excessive pumping of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is threatening to upset the delicate balance of nature. More carbon is now entering the atmosphere 
that can be removed through photosynthesis and other natural means. The most widely recognized indicator of global climate change is the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Let me say at this point, for the record, where is this stuff? I wanted to, I wanted to close this, but I can't. Hmm. Oh, let me, let me see if I can do that. No, I, I can't. It's, it's just, okay. Let me say for the record that about 95%, and I'm hoping that I'm, I have my numbers right, right that about 95% of the population of the world agrees with what this video says. Namely, not everybody does agree with this, but it's 95%. So that's why we say that it is the, the, year the one majority. Shows a complete record to date, which spans the period from March 1958 to March 2019. The red curve shows the seasonal variations, while the black curve shows the average annual trend. This curve is referred to as the Keeling curve in honor of Charles David Keeling who started the record. It is clear from the record that the concentration of carbon dioxide, which was around 318 in 1958, has now, in March 2019, reached 410 ppm, all the while showing a definitely upward trend. These numbers show that the concentration of carbon dioxide. There is some reason to believe, I should add this, it's important. There is some reason to believe that over the last, that the Keeling curve is, is not going to be, uh, I, guess, I guess you could put it this way, that the pandemic is going to affect the, the upward growth of the Keeling curve to some extent, because the amount of activity, economic activity has decreased over the world. So again, this is what I said earlier. One good thing brings a bad thing and vice versa. It has increased about 29% in the past 60 years of record. Most scientists believe that the rise in the Keeling curve is due to the excessive burning of fossil fuels, which once in the atmosphere tend to accumulate since there is no natural way of returning to the earth in the quantities in which it is being burned. In effect, the atmosphere is seen to be acting as a convenient dump for the excess carbon. How does the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide affect global climate change? In other words, how does an increase in atmospheric CO2 produce global warming? To answer this question, we need to look at the constituents of the atmosphere. A, nitrogen 78 percent b oxygen 21 percent c water vapor 0.4 percent d carbon dioxide several years ago i guess people i i published a paper called 33 uh facts about global warming it was a good it was a good paper at at, at one time around the time of gore in the year 2005 it had a lot of traffic it had about 500 hits per day, which I consider to be very high. Uh, so one day about maybe eight years ago, I got, a, I got a, uh, an email from a, a professor at a university in Canada. It was not one of the major universities in Canada, but it was a university in Canada, nevertheless. And he took me to task. He said, Professor Pons, you're wrong. Um, how is it that CO2, which only occupies 0.04% of the atmosphere can have such a huge effect. He was, he was disbelieving. And of course he had not read the major works. Namely, he obviously had not read uh, uh, Arrhenius. So I just said, uh, I sent him the reference. I said, here's the reference. And he answered to me a week later saying, thank you, you've illustrated me, open my eyes. So as you can see, uh, unless you seek and get the truth, the real truth of the science, it, it's hard to believe this stuff. 
0.04%, and E, smaller percentages of other gases. While the constituents of the atmosphere are subject to change in geologic time, they tend to be essentially constant when viewed in the time scale of human interest, say 100 years. The exception is carbon dioxide, which has increased about 29% in the past 60 years. In 1896, Svante Arrhenius published a paper entitled On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground, where he pioneered the science of global warming. He reasoned that the air retains heat in two ways. One, by diffusion, as the heat passes through the air, and two, by selective absorption, since some atmospheric constituents absorb great quantities of heat. Nitrogen and oxygen, the atmosphere's primary constituents, are homonuclear diatomic molecules, too tightly bound together to be able to absorb heat through vibration. The selective absorption of heat is accomplished by carbon dioxide and water vapor, two non-diatomic molecules which are present in the air in small quantities. These two molecules consist of two elements and more than two atoms bound together loosely enough to be able to vibrate somewhat with the absorption of infrared radiation. Eventually, the vibrating molecule will emit the radiation again, and it will likely be absorbed by yet another molecule. This absorption, emission, absorption cycle serves to keep part of the heat near the Earth's surface, insulating the latter from the cold of outer space. Other heat-absorbing non-diatomic compounds, such as methane and nitrous oxide, are also present in the atmosphere albeit at much smaller concentrations. Of the two more important non-diatomic constituents of the atmosphere, water vapor and carbon dioxide, only the latter has a clear anthropogenic origin. Water vapor varies in the atmosphere in largely unpredictable ways, with no direct human influence in the time scale of analysis. The selective absorption of heat through vibration by the non-diatomic components of the atmosphere effectively means that these serve as a blanket to retain heat near the Earth's ground surface, impeding its diffusion into stellar space. Their concentration is an indication of the thickness of the blanket. Thus, a carbon dioxide concentration of 410 ppm ought to be about 29% more effective in retaining heat than a concentration of 318 ppm. That this is indeed the case is demonstrated by the record of global land ocean temperatures shown in figure three. This figure shows global surface temperature anomalies, the black squares and their five year running means, the red curve using a base period of 1950 to 1980. The data indicates that global surface temperatures have increased about 0.6 degrees Celsius since 1960. Thus, there is very good reason to believe that figure two is the cause and figure three the effect, and that the Earth's surface air temperatures are increasing. Since the burning of fossil fuels is the only process that can pump carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in such great quantities, it is readily seen how this activity, which has taken place in earnest in the past 50 years, may be regarded as the culprit. The effect that protracted global warming will have on the global hydrologic cycle, on the weather and climate, and on the world's ice caps and glaciers is now beginning to be examined. Here we focus on the wide range of Peru, which features the largest concentration of glaciers in the tropics. It is clear that global warming is bound to significantly affect these glaciers. The white range of Peru is located between 8 degrees 23 minutes and 10 degrees 2 minutes south latitude, 
encompassing 122 mountain peaks with elevations about 5,000 meters, of which 15 of them lie about 6,000 meters. In 1970, the aerial extent of the glaciers was measured at 723 square kilometers, which comprised 26% of the area covered by all tropical glaciers. There are 755 glaciers in the White Range. As it is usual in the tropics, these glaciers are small in aerial extent, averaging one square kilometer, with only 12 of them exceeding five square kilometers. This figure shows the salient geographical features of the White Range. A, the outline of the basin of the Rio Santa, or Santa River. B, the location of the snow-capped White Range along the eastern boundary. And C, the snow-free Black Range along the western boundary. The following are noted. One, principal mountain peaks above 6,000 meters elevation. Two, cities in the vicinity, Caraz, Yungay, Huaraz, and Recuay. Three, meteorological station at Quirococha. Four, glaciers Broji, Uruas Raju, and Yanamare. And five, lakes with risk of avalanche. The effect of global climate change on the health of tropical glaciers is predictable. There is and will continue to be glacier melt, which depending on the extent of the recession may partially or totally compromise glacier integrity. The glaciers of the White Range are large compared to other glaciers of the tropics and therefore are likely to last longer. I'm going to skip five minutes because we don't have the time. If you're interested, you can rewatch it. During the dry season, may be surmised. Overall, runoff has three sources. One, melting of glaciers. Two, direct runoff, which comes from precipitation. And three, base flow. In the White Range, researchers have reported significant differences between the composition of the average annual runoff and that corresponding to the dry season. For example, in Lake Irococha, Data indicates that during the dry season, melt volume is half the runoff volume, while the average annual volume of melt is only a quarter. The glaciers of the White Range have sustained the population of the upper Santa River for millennia. The entire region is referred to locally as the Callejon de Huaylas or Huaylas Corridor, due to its elongated shape along the river, flanked by the White Range to the east and the Black Range to the west. The population, consisting of about 320,000 people, is distributed among hundreds of small rural settlements, with approximately half of the people living in major urban clusters along the Santa River, including the cities of Huaraz, Yungay, Caraz, and Recuay. Huaraz, a major urban center, with about 120,000 people, is the capital of the Department of Ancash. The danger of glacial lake outburst floods and avalanches remains a threat in the White Range and very likely to be exacerbated by continuing global climate change. Table 6 documents the most important glacial lake outburst floods of the past 75 years. A total of 29 have been documented since the year 1725, with the majority of them occurring in the past century alone. The cities affected have been Huaraz, Chavín de Huantar, Huayanca, and Caraz. climate change, specifically anthropogenic global warming, threatens to upset the delicate balance of nature, wherein the global climate 
is determined by the concentration of non-diatomic gases in the atmosphere, among them significantly carbon dioxide. The sustained warming of the past 50 years has produced a host of negative effects. Here we highlight the effect that global warming has had on the tropical glaciers, including melting, recession, and their possible eventual disappearance. This places in jeopardy the continuance of a wide array of natural services, among them the supply of water resources, the conservation of flora and fauna, the aesthetics of the natural landscape, and the societal activities of tourism, mountaineering, and alpinism. We specifically focus on the wide range of Peru, a resource of global importance and significant aesthetic value. Life of all kinds stands to be negatively affected by protracted global warming and the impairment of the wide range. The following conclusions are drawn. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has reached 410 ppm at the present time, March 2019. The increase has been mostly attributed to the excessive burning of fossil fuels. Global average surface temperatures have increased about 0.6 degrees Celsius in the past 50 years. The rise in global surface temperatures has negatively affected the tropical glaciers, causing a decrease in aerial coverage. The changes have been gradual, but the rate of change appears to be increasing. Average rates of glacier recession over the period 1930 to 2009 have been measured at 0.62% per year, and over the period 1990 to 2009 at 0.81% per year. A recent official study has documented that the loss of glacier area in the White Range in the period 1970 to 2003 has been 27%. The lakes have nearly doubled in number over the past 60 years from 223 at the time of the first inventory in 1953 to more than 800 at the present time. Continuing glacier melting poses a significant threat of glacial lake outburst floods. The latter consists of water, snow, ice, and debris. If not adequately controlled, these disastrous events will spell havoc and destruction in the communities located directly in the path of the floods. Urban relocation, although a sensible decision in the eyes of many, remains politically difficult. Many of these devastating floods have occurred in the wide range in the past 100 years, and the chances are that they will continue to recur. Relevant scientific understanding coupled with enlightened interdisciplinary management is necessary for the national government of Peru and its partners in the international community to develop an effective strategy to cope with these threats. Sustainability being clearly out of the question, the aim remains to mitigate and reduce the effects of global warming within the next one to two generations. I want to state that the reason why I said in there that sustainability is out of the question, because it cannot be affected immediately. If we're going to become sustainable, it would have to be done in one or two generations. There is no way out of that one. Okay, well, thank you. We reached our time. So I will see you next uh, Tuesday.